So good evening everybody. I think we can start with this webinar number seven for the EU party. I am Giulio Maria Corbelli. I am a member of the editorial board for the EU party project. I'm also a member of the European AIDS Treatment Group. I was diagnosed with HIV in 1997, so uh, I start my, my journey in the disease, then I joined the European AIDS Treatment Group in 2009. Now I am chairing within the, the EATG, the European Community Advisory Board, which is kind of the scientific working group within EATG. And I joined kind of one year ago the editorial board of the EU party. Also, I am a patient representative for some research projects uh, in, in the HIV field in general. Uh, we can um, start this this webinar, which is uh, about the, the 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 new toolbox of the UPATI, how to create trainings with the UPATI toolbox. You know, there is a lot of materials uh, from UPATI you can use to train uh, to to run trainings within your patient organizations, and we are trying now to address all the questions you may have about how to use the the, the toolbox, which is a kind of of so new uh, uh, tool we have. We have two speakers, John Lenehan and Matthew May, so we can uh, ask them all the questions we have. Uh, before we start, I want to remind you a couple of things. This webinar will be recorded, is recorded actually. <laughs> it is recorded and in, uh, the, the recording will be uploaded on the UPATI website so you can disseminate also the recording of, of the webinar among your friends and colleagues. Uh, whenever during the presentation, so you're in the webinar, you have to answer, please type it in the question box you can find on the right hand, usually, of your screen. Uh, you can see a question box, you can type your question there, and once the presentation is over, we can ask the presenter to uh, answer the questions you had. I uh, don't think we have uh, many um, things to add. You can see the agenda of our uh, webinar today on your screen. Uh, we will have uh, the first presentation, which is done from, by John Lenehan. Uh, John is the research and development manager at Ibernia College in Ireland, but he also leading the work package with the new party, which is managing all aspects of IT for the new party project. He he's doing this because he has a, in, a great experience in the deployment of open source web applications, planning web architectures and user requirement gathering and application testing. He has over 11 years experience working in graphic, interactive, instru instructional and UX design within an e-learning context. So he is our IT genius. Um, and as any IT genius is usually sitting at his computers, but when he is not there, you can find probably him outside running or cycling or doing some, some sports. So uh, if John is ready, uh, I will hand over to you for your presentation, John. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julio, for that uh, amazing introduction. <laughs> if I could, if I could just ask everybody, can they see my slide all right there, and if they can hear me clearly? We can. I can see your slide, and we can hear you very clearly. So I think you can go ahead. Thank you. Great. As Julio said, um, I look after some the IT part of the UPATI project and in my presentation today I'm going to give you an overview of the statistics of the amount of people that have been using the UPATI toolbox since it launched publicly in January in the first part of the presentation and then in the second part of the presentation I'm going to look at the part of the UPATI course that we made available for download um, to the public under Creative Commons and just talk about some of the technical questions that have uh, arisen uh, since we made it available. So without further ado, <clears throat> so since, since the website launched um, on the 27th of January, 
you can see from our graph here, it is going slightly up, <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, generally, since the launch, we've ha had to focus on a lot of technical issues around providing all of the information through all of the seven languages of translation, with two new languages coming on board before the end of January, uh, hopefully Dutch and Romanian. We can see a slight peak here towards the last couple of months um, in usage, and this is really a sign of the website moving from being established and becoming stable to the, the recent influx flux of blog posts and uh, community contributions to the website. So it's great to see the growth happening and for the website to become more flexible in the content that it offers. Just some of the basic stats, we roughly get about 20,000 page views a month. We've detected over 55,000 unique users worldwide. And that's resulted in about 170,000 page views since launch. So it's great to see that people are being able to access the website and find the material and, and that it is serving its purpose in that respect. So where do our visitors come from? Um, this is just an overview on a, on a worldwide perspective. Um, I think when the website launched, certainly the countries have jumped around a lot, um, but at the moment Italy has taken the number one spot with Germany um, in second. Um, United Kingdom was pretty high because a lot of the content was in English, but as translations have come online, the other countries, and that's great to see. Um, and I'm personally delighted to see uh, non-English countries uh, rising to the top um, because it shows the website in its multilingual aspect is, is really working as it should. Um, so you can see uh, good usage from a lot of countries uh, worldwide there. The top UPATI languages, again, I have consolidated some of these languages. English is by far the biggest, but that takes into consideration it combines all types of English, whether it's US English, UK English, and Irish English across the board. So it's probably a little bit misleading to see it's that big. Um, but again, you can see the languages that are represented on the website pretty much reflect the countries. Um, that have been used. The most uh, one thing to note on this slide is that the two countries that are there, which are basically the Netherlands, um, which are peaking pretty high, which means people are accessing the website from the Netherlands. We don't have it ready in Dutch, but it will be ready in Dutch um, by by next January. So there already is a need and a lot of interest um, from the Netherlands. The top twenty. Uh, search terms used on the website. Uh, this is what people are, these are, these are the words that people are typing into the website, what exactly they're looking for. Um, we can see webinar and toolbox being uh, number one and two to reflect the marketing activities that are being done and the amount of webinars that we've had lately running through the site. Um, so people are looking for more uh, current information and are enjoying the exchanges that are happening in webinars and the information being presented. Um, you can see a lot of the other keywords here, <coughs> which are very useful to Matthew and his team who design content and will be deciding what content gets updated and added next year um, as we build up more analytical data about what people are looking for on the website. It can guide certainly uh, what content is enhanced next year. Um, while I'm on this slide, you can see that I have the words PIP highlighted there, and somebody had asked a question, um, what did PIP stand for? So I was of the opinion that it could have been a spelling mistake, <laughs> but um, I did what everybody should do. I typed PIP into the UPATI website and found out that it stood for, it was an acronym for Pediatric Investigation Plan. So it's either a spelling mistake or people are searching for pediatric investigation plan. Uh, Google will only tell me so much. 
So I'll just carry on with that. Reverse this. You can see the keywords that are used there, they're for your interest. Um, again, site categories in order of popula popularity on the website. Um, this is what Google tells us people are searching for, but it's important to understand that on the front of the website that we have a big box of buttons that display all of these categories and the basics of medicines development is the very first one. Uh, <clears throat> so more testing is required from our half to see that people, are people more, more people interested in actual the basics of medicines development on the website or are they just clicking the first button they come across. Um, so this is a good example of building up stats and the type of testing we can do to really drill down to see what people want. Uh, the top articles viewed on the website, these articles are pulled up again um, mostly to organic searches through Google searches and these would be uh, the top information articles that are viewed on the website. Take some time to have a look through them there, um, nothing in particular standing out um, in terms of inferences um, which I'll go through at the end. This is also a list of top downloaded files from the website. Um, we can infer a few things from this. Number one, downloads are overall across the site are pretty weak. Uh, we've, there's a lot of fact sheets and presentations that are available for people to download and reuse within their own sphere of work and they're all released under Creative Commons. And Downloads are slow, we would expect them to be slow because the downloaded article, the downloadable files at the moment are kind of embedded into articles. We want people to access and read articles and then download a, a summary of the content really in a, in a PowerPoint or in a fact sheet. But the, we've, there's a lot of efforts underway to, I suppose, look at phase two of the website now in which we bring that content out to people in a much more structured manner. And Matthew will touch a little bit of this in his part of the presentation around mini courses. Um, but we can certainly um, infer that some of the downloadable files that are the most popular may suggest that people are looking for more introductory content. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. More interestingly, you know, the demographics of the website, the majority of users are in the 25 to 34 and um, slowly tapering off. Um, again, this probably reflects IT technology um, and the age groups that are comfortable in using it. But again, it's something we can, we can use certainly to direct content. Gender of people using the website since January, you can see a large percentage of people accessing content are female. You may be asking, how do I know whether a person is male or female <laughs> who is accessing the website? We don't have cameras in your house. But uh, Google can use its systems to try and detect um, the people who are visiting the site based on uh, cookies on their computer and probably other things they've searched for within Google. Um, so this is just the standard thing that's offered by Google, but again, it gives us an insight into who our users are. The types of devices that are used to access the website, uh, the majority of, the, of it is desktop, um, and that's just for your interest. Some slight inferences uh, to date. Um, we know that two thirds of the users, as I said, are female. Um, I'm interested to find out whether that is the same with other health, health sites. I don't particularly know why that is the case here. Um, our largest age group, as we said, is between 23 and 44. I'm guessing the younger generation is doing the searching for an older generation, and that's the most obvious thing I can think of. 77% um, of users access the website using a desktop. To me, this is surprising because I would assume a lot of these, this age group uses um, phones and tablets. Um, so something else to try and consider for us to get to the bottom of. Um, between the downloads and the articles used, 
we did feel it, it is obvious that uh, there is a demand for more basic um, subjects of content um, and that's something that can inform Matthew's team moving forward and the type of content that's the most popular and it obviously forms good information about surveys and that type of thing. Um, and as I said already, fact sheets and presentations um, were, are not being made accessible enough. Like there's a load of them there that people can use on the website. They're really handy. They'll save you time. Um, and as Matthew's mini courses will show you now, that we will be doing our best to bring them out. So that brings me on to just the Moodle download um, file that, that we made available. So when I get to the end of these slides, uh, people will have an opportunity to ask any questions they want. Um, so I'm just going to show you the web page that we made available um, for people to download a version of the expert course. So it's upati.eu forward slash download. And there's a form there that you can fill out and you can download a file for free that contains all of the expert course. And so I'll just bring back up my presentation. So um, the, the course download package has been downloaded 180 times. Um, to date, the download format of the Moodle archive is an MBZ file. So most people wanted to download this file and thought that they could access the content, but that isn't the case, and I'll try and explain why. Um, in order to view the M MBZ file, you must have a live installation of Moodle. So I'm going to show you about what's involved with that and how you can get that, and really who who this is aimed for. Um, so Moodle is the format of the file that it was presented with, and, and Moodle is an online learning platform course management system. And really, it, it enabled UPATI to train all of its learners over all the countries in Europe um, for the majority of the time where they weren't face to face for two weeks or four weeks during the year. So, the Moodle archive file does not contain like Word documents or PDFs, it contains a lot of um, semantic and instructional information about how the course is put together. In particular, yes, it contains le lesson titles and descriptions, the lesson paths that must be followed, the quizzes for the lessons, the specific quiz settings, forum setups and questions. So it's not just a, really a collection. I know that a lot of the, the students, when they logged onto the system, they would just see the content, the text and the images and the quizzes. Um, and that's good because they're not meant to see the system supporting it. But the file that we supplied is much more powerful than just a collection of Word documents or PDFs. It pretty much allows anybody who can get a Moodle installation up and running, which I'll show you how to do it, to deploy this course in their organization or in their country with all of this added benefit. So really, the download file that we've provided is intended for organizations or educational institutions who already have Moodle installed on their web server or who have the IT resource to install and run it. It's not intended for individuals with no experience of Moodle. We were, the original plan was to say that it, individuals who wanted to access the course content could do so from the toolbox in a, yes, it's in a slightly different format, but um, Matthew will talk more about that in a second. So if you were interested, your organization or educational institute was, it, was interested in how, how can we host Moodle, so if we can't do it ourselves, um, really Moodle needs to be installed on a web server. I mean, you can install an individual Moodle file on your PC, but it's really only for test purposes and it will serve no purpose and you're, you're probably going to run into a lot of technical issues. So because Moodle is a open source application, it needs to be installed on a web server. And to give you a rough idea of cost, uh, there are 
this is the provider that we use. These are a UK based, based provider for this project. The company is called How to Moodle. And this is a rough idea of the costs associated with the maintaining um, a Moodle installation over the year. So for the UPATI course itself, that approximately costs around 2,000 euro a year to host. And that 2,000 euro also contains support hours. Um, so access to IT people that can keep it all smooth and running for you, so you don't have to uh, worry about the IT side of things. Um, how to Moodle is the one op option that I've mentioned here. And then there is the Moodle Cloud. So I think there's uh, Moodle Cloud, if you do a search in Google for Moodle Cloud. Now that's an unsupported service. Um, I know that you can certainly get a free account there for 50 users. Um, and that download file will can be uploaded and installed in there straight away. Um, so as you can see, the download file that we have provided is once imported into the Moodle system, offers a way bigger system than just the individual content documents. It offers the possibility for you to run the expert course um, as, as we have done with all of the semantic data for quizzes, learning paths, and instruction, um, all installed in there. But you can see that it is quite specialist, um, but it's very powerful um, as well. So as I move on to my last slide for any questions, um, I will hand back to Julio, who will, feel, who will manage the questions. And please feel free to ask anything. So we're just waiting for uh, Julio to come online there. Um, he's, he's just muted. Uh, hi, everybody. This is Ingrid Hain. Um, John, I can see one question that came up from John Jordan. She asked, how large is the expert course download? Yeah, good question, John. I don't remember, but I, it's quite small. I think it's around uh, 50 megabytes, I think. 49.7. Ah, so close. Yeah, so around 50 megabytes, quite small, very compact. Um, And maybe while Julio is connecting there, I know that some questions were asked, so I can um, run through them now. Um, one of the first questions was, how long do we know how long visitors stay on a page uh, during their visit to the website? Um, the answer is, uh, that's too vague a question. <laughs> um, Google will say the average duration people visit our site for is for two minutes and nine seconds. But that's a broad time over everybody that visits the website. Some people might come and browse through the articles for 10 minutes, a half an hour or an hour. And then other people who have been to the website before might just come to the front page and see that there ha there's no news update on it and leave again. And that kind of skews the results. So. Um, I had to dig a little bit, and I, I would need to really have a look to see how much time people are spending on specific articles in there um, in the system. But I would hope not very long, because uh, gr the content has been through many uh, 
editorial processes and has the the language has been too many uh, steps as well to make as easy as possible so we'll be hoping people can get their content as quickly as possible from the website um, but if you ask Google they say people spend two minutes on our site but I don't it, it, you know it's not very specific that um, that time um, another question was which I covered already, but I'll just go over again. It said, how much, what range are we talking about if I wish to install the Moodle platform? So I talked about two different services there. One was how to Moodle. And I know from our experience, we spend 2,000 euro a year hosting the current UPATI site for both cohorts. Um, and that 2,000 euro includes support hours. So if something stops working, we would go to their, their experts and ask for advice on how to fix it, or in some cases get them to fix it for us. Um, but to be honest, we haven't had to use that support very much because it's, it's a fairly robust system and it works fairly well. And the import of content um, has been flawless in any of the tests that we've done. Um, and the other service that I talked about was Moodle.com. Um, forward slash cloud. So if you did a search for Moodle Cloud, you'd find it. And they have a free plan that allows you 50 students for free, um, all the way up to, they have a mini, small and medium plan that range from 200 up to 700 euros. So it's a lot cheaper, the Moodle Cloud plan. Um, but it's not clear what level of support you get with it. So if we were recommending uh, first-time Moodlers to deploy this course within their organization or institution, um, we would definitely suggest how to Moodle who are based in the UK. Um, and your initial plan could be in the range of 1,000 euro. Thank you, John. Um, I'm taking uh, over thanks. from Julio. Oh. Yes, uh, Julio, I'm are you back? back? Sorry. I, yeah, I'm back. I'm sorry. <laughs> Some IT problems can may occur sometimes. <laughs> Thank you very much, John, for your presentation. I, I, as far as I could understand, you already answered some of the questions that were asked on the on the question box on the on the right hand side. Uh, I, I'm, I I will just try um, to ask some more questions that are coming. Uh, Marcel is asking whether whether it is possible to add new content yourself ourselves. I mean, I, I guess he's, he's meaning where, whether users can contribute to the content. This is more a questions for for Matthew maybe, or or a technical, or maybe you can answer from a technical point of view, and then we can also discuss it with Matthew. Um, Matthew would probably be the person to. Um, answer this question directly. Um, we don't have this technical ability to be set up on the site to do this, but uh, that is for good reason. And uh, Matthew, maybe you can explain a little bit more about the editorial checks that your team does with content and the possibility of sure, so and how people would um, send you ideas for content, maybe. Sure. So. I'm not sure whether Marcel's talking about the toolbox or the expert training course, so I'll answer both. So within the toolbox setting, uh, we actually take all the content through a fairly extreme editorial process. Uh, so you cannot simply upload something onto the website itself, as John mentioned. You can, however, email the uh, UParty support email address and get in touch with us if you want to contribute something. We're never going to put up disease-specific content or country-specific content outside of the national um, pages within the toolbox. But if it's general content, for example, we've recently had some people working on uh, some biobanking information, some work they've done within the, I believe it's the Spanish NLT, and there's parts of that that are applicable to the whole of Europe. And so we're turning it into a content piece where they're writing the content piece for us and we'll then take it through our editorial checks. Uh, all the content gets checked by an editorial team which is comprising all of the stakeholder groups in your party. So a group of six people for the toolbox. Uh, everything's reviewed. And then it'll be formatted for the web. Uh, we'll add in the various search terms, metadata that allow people to find it through Google, through the web page, at which point it becomes available in English. And then we send it off for translation. 
it gets translated into the six other languages. It goes through another round of checks for the translations um, to, to see if they've translated it correctly, at which point it's then available in all seven languages on the website. If, however, you're talking about the expert training course, so you download the Moodle package, you host it yourself or you host it with a provider, then yes, of course, it's very simple to add in new content. You can customize it. You can add in your own examples from a disease-specific area. You can add in country-specific examples. Um, we've built a lot of the content in Moodle using Moodle itself. So there are features in there that allow you to build mini web pages um, as well as lots of other content. So you can add new content to it. You can customize the content we're already there. All of that's open for you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, another question is whether the UPATI fellows uh, will be able to access the original Moodle after January 2017. Is there any limitation in time for, for the access of the original Moodle? And this is John here. I believe they will be able to access it. Um, the first cohort was still allowed to access content. I assume this will be extended for the second cohort. And so, yes, they will be able to access it. That is my understanding at the moment. I can confirm that's in the plan, that anyone who's been through it as a, through the official UParty course will maintain their login access to content going forward. Great. Another, uh, one, one more question is, when new languages like Dutch are added, will the new content be translated in those languages too? Well, yeah, this specifically relates to the information displayed in the toolbox at the website upati.eu. So at the moment, the expert course is only available in English. But the content of the upati.eu website, the toolbox, uh, when the Dutch translation goes live, everything will be available in Dutch. That's on that website. Right. Thank you. Um, I also have a question for you, John, about the downloadable material. You were talking about uh, the, the, all, all these downloads which are embedded in the articles. Do you think there is an, any way to make them more easily accessible for, for the users and downloadable? Um, the, the short answer to that is no. Um, uh, the content of the expert course is completely tied up in the Moodle format. That was the way the course was designed. And the individual lessons and pages, it was designed in that way because the lessons, the content of the lessons needed to follow an instructional path. In a, normal, in, in a scaffolding sense that certain lessons needed to be gone through before you could go on to the next sessions. So in isolation, the sessions by themselves, in some cases, may not make sense. So everything is tied up in Moodle, but my colleague Matthew will certainly tell you that all of the content that is in the toolbox was derived from the content in the expert course. It was the source for all of it. So the content that's available in the toolbox at upati.eu is the same content but it has been modified to work in a standalone that each article does not depend on another article for content. Each article is self-contained. Great, thank you. We have a question from Diana. Uh, she asks, uh, would you please clarify how individuals can use the course? I guess that this is exactly the topic of Matthew's presentation, so Matthew, you are going to explain all this in your, during your presentation, am I right? To an extent, I mean, the course is not there for an individual to be used. The course is there for a organization or an institution to put on the course for many other people. Uh, whether someone out there chooses to take it and make it self-sign up that many people can access it without having to become a formal part of a class or something, that's still to be seen. Um, if you want to get access to the content, though, as John's just been alluding to, 
pretty much all of it, I mean, we're talking more than 80% of the content that's found in the course is also found in the toolbox. We've just simply broken apart the lessons, mixed them around to try and make them more self-contained. I mean, John alluded to the fact that every article is self-contained. I'm not quite sure if we've managed to hit that exactly on the head, um, but to a large extent, those articles that you find in the toolbox should be able to be understood out of context with all of the other articles that are there. So sure, lots of them will feed into each other, um, but the specific information about one thing should not require any prior module that you've been through, for example. Um, so that would be the way to do it. And yeah, as I say, the course is designed for a group of 20, 30 plus people to go through it together, and we also do exercises as part of the course where we ask the students to put their thoughts on paper through forums to talk to each other about certain issues, and that's part of the learning process as well. Since you are there, can you also answer Isabel's question? Uh, she asks, uh, who is in charge with the design of the modules? Who is busy or who is in charge with the design of the modules? So the modules for the training course were designed uh, by a group that I lead in Work Package 4. Um, we have a team of, I think at last count, it's about 26 people. And between us, we looked at other training that was out there and used it as a basis to design our own training course. Um, we also looked into university courses as well as existing patient training courses or lay people training courses when we looked at the design. So the design itself and the syllabus and the modular setup that we've used has pretty much been set in stone for about three and a half, four years now. Um, and we've also used that as a way of categorizing our information in the toolbox. Um, as John said, I mean, as I've said as well, we've derived that material out of our course so it was logical to take over that way of categorizing, grouping the information going forward. We've not been designing any new modules for the course since we launched the uh, course back in, what was it, 2013. Uh, what we have done, though, is updated the lessons. We've moved things around a bit. Um, so for now, there hasn't been any design on the modules for, for a couple of years. Thank you again. Uh, Vincenzo is uh, suggesting something for our material, for our UPATI material. He's suggesting to bring the toolbox in hospitals so that each patient can view it. Uh, he thinks he's a, a very good way to use the, the, the toolbox. If I may, I would like to say that, in my opinion, this is the role of, of us as patient organization representative to, to use the toolbox in, a, in the way we, we think it can be more easily accessible, but if you, Matthew or John, have something to say about these suggestions, you're welcome. Um, I, Matthew, have you anything to say there? No, I mean, I, I like every idea on how to take the toolbox to more people. Um, we are providing the basis of that toolbox. And a little bit of what I'm going to talk about in, in a few minutes' time now is one way some of us within the UPATI team have already started to want to use that material, so we've decided to share it with everyone through these mini course starter kits that we've been designing. So I strongly encourage you, if you've got such an idea, to have a go at it. Um, if you want to do it with someone, post through the Twitter on New Party or through Facebook, see if there's someone else who's interested in working on a little mini project to do it, and try it out. And uh, if there's, I mean, when there's success, I won't say if, when there's success, um, feedback to the project, how you changed the content or how you reformatted the content or how you presented it to the patients uh, in the hospital setting so that we can also think about sharing that back to the community of your party as a whole and also get it translated into the other languages. Great. Thank you again, Matthew. We have another question from Diana. Uh, is there a list of organizations hosting the expert, expert course? Because being a small patient organization, it is impossible to spend thousands of euros to host the course, even if we would love to. So maybe this is an interesting suggestion also, how to um, create networks among different organizations so the, that the material can be also used in a, in a networking system. 
Um, I'm not aware of any list of, of organizations that are hosting this. Uh, Matthew alluded to this earlier that uh, he wasn't aware of anyone that was providing this information for free. I mean, of course, the obvious way to access the information is, is um, certainly try and get a, a representative from your organization on the course. But given the limited places, we understand how difficult that is. Um, but I think we're in agreement that um, if we certainly do hear of anybody that is providing the course in the manner that you're speaking about we w and is willing to support that, uh, we'll certainly make it known to all of the channels in New Patty. So make sure that you are subscribed to the website and on our newsletter at newpatty.eu so that you can be made that you can be kept up to date with any types of uh, new advances like that. Thank you, John. Uh, one more question from Marcel. Uh, he's a bit confused on the difference between the toolbox and the training course materials. Can someone among you, Matthew, John, clarify the difference between these two sources yeah. of content? Certainly, I'd like to give it a try. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the training course materials, we're talking about the UPATI expert training course. So this is, uh, this is run in Moodle. It takes in 50 students a year, and they are brought on a blended learning course to become a UPATI fellow. So that's a specific online course that needs to be applied for and carried out over a duration of I think 18 months or a year. And when we talk about the toolbox, so in the training course is very specific and to a certain degree it's private for those students that are on that course. When we talk about the toolbox, we're talking about the free and publicly available information at, upa at upati.eu. So the toolbox information at upati.eu is presented in a format that's free for anybody free to access, publicly available. Is that clearer, Marcel? I think so, but if, if I can uh, elaborate on that, uh, maybe the, the question was more about uh, is part of the training course materials also reproduced in the toolbox? I mean, just the content. Okay. Uh, part of the content maybe can be has been reproduced in the toolbox so that it, it is accessible. There is an interaction uh, or among these two. Yeah, Matthew, maybe you'd like to um, explain just. I know you mentioned it already. Uh, the difference between the content in the two in the toolbox and the content in the course. Sure. So the content in the course. So the course takes 18 months to do, approximately. We say it takes a couple of people a little bit longer, a couple of people a little bit less time. Um, it's built over six modules. So those modules are set up in a flow. This means that you get this very introductory module in module one and further modules build on what you've learned in previous modules. So we no longer go through and each time explain a concept. We rely on the fact that you've gone through a lesson and have learned a concept, have learned the language and also learned the acronyms associated with information that is pushed into a given lesson. So when we came to design the toolbox, we had to reverse all of this thinking and say, okay, we need to think that for each article, someone will come in directly from Google and not have that pre-knowledge that they've gained through it already doing module one, module two, and 12 lessons from module three, um, which means that we have to go through and always explain with little introductory sentences or explanations or with the use of our glossary as well, what the different concepts are to make sure that the article as a whole can be understood with very little pre-existing knowledge. Great. Thank you. I, I think this clarifies a, a lot. Um, as um, uh, I'm, 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 there is one more comment from Diana, who is elaborating on uh, her previous question about the list of organizations hosting the expert course. So she's suggesting to to create a network of organizations, mainly the rare diseases patients organizations, because maybe are, are a bit smaller, who can 
join together and buy Moodle all together so that to make it available for the community. Is there any way we uh, can facilitate the creation of this network among the patients' organization? I'm, I'm not sure. I would have to um, ask my colleagues to see uh, what is possible here, but probably for us to provide a single sign-up thing for an entire country probably would be outside the context of the project. But certainly for individual groups in countries probably don't need us to help them facilitate to do this. You know, if multiple organizations can get together and find the funding to host their own Moodle platform, um, they can reduce the cost amongst themselves and have all the access that they need. So I'm not particularly sure how if there would be a need for us to facilitate that work. And um, if there are local networks in countries, they could probably pool their resources together and achieve this fairly easily if they can find a Moodle provider in their country and negotiate the best price they can to host it. And, you know, get that get the, the Moodle provider to upload the course, then they can all, all have access. Um, I think it would certainly be outside of the scope um, and the resources that we have to provide this type of network. Um, if we did it in one country, you know, we would want to do it in all countries and we just wouldn't have the, the manpower to do that. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with people up doing this within their own net networks. Um, as I said in my slides, they just need to find a Moodle provider, download the file and install it, and then they have access to the content. Um, you know, Can I just step I in, John? Of course, Matthew, yeah. Yeah, I'd just say we do have the uh, the networks almost existing in Uparty already. I mean, we have a number of our Uparty uh, national platforms or European national platforms now um, in a number of, I think Laura was telling me, it was around 18 countries at the last count. So that's already one place where people are networking through Uparty who they can get in touch with each other and find each other. Um, we also have, of course, our various social media channels um, which if you bounce uh, tags or hashtags off of us um, you with other people uh, who are interested in doing a similar thing because we do have a lot of followers through those channels so it may be a way of reaching out beyond a particularly a certain uh, disease area if you want to go for multiple disease areas. I know you're talking about rare diseases specifically um, but it may even be worth extending it to the wider patient population beyond. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, Matthew. I think we can, and thank you, John, also for replying to this question for your presentation. I think we can move on to Matthew's presentation. But, John, please stay online, stay there, because we will have another round of questions after Matthew's presentation, and maybe you will be asked to reply some of these questions, if you don't mind. Uh, well, um, Matthew will, will, will present uh, a bit more specifically about the starter kit and how to organize a training with using the toolbox. Uh, as previously said, Matthew is the, the EU party project manager. He's based at DIA in Basel, Switzerland, and he coordinates the, the development of all educational content in EU party, chairs the editorial boards, which review all material before they are released on the toolbox and the patient expert training course, the editorial board I'm a proud member of. Um, he has a background in chemistry and training uh, and has an interest in technology, so he has put his experience to use uh, creative les lessons and articles for UParty. Uh, if you have read uh, any piece of UParty educational content, it is pretty much guaranteed that Matthew has read it too, probably more than once. He knows everything. I'm always very surprised at how, how he can have a perfect idea of all the content in UParty. There is a, a huge amount of content, as, as you know. Um, and when, uh, in, during those brief moments away from the U party, uh, you'll likely find Matthew outside training with a scouting program or traveling the world because he's also a very passionate traveler. Uh, so Matthew, I will hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julia. I'll just take control of things there. Um, so as Julia said, I am the project manager for 
content development and production within the UPARTY project. Uh, everything that we've produced for the educational content has come across my desk at one point or another. I've probably coordinated its creation, uh, which also means that I'm very happy to have this opportunity now to share with you a little bit of my brain and the way it connects all of this different content together um, on a little project that we started spontaneously within a number of people within the Upati group. So we obviously launched the Upati page, uh, what was it, eight months ago, ten months ago now, in, back in the end of January. And at the time we laid it out in the form of articles, um, let me just do what John did there and give you the full view. So we laid it out in articles which you can access through our main page, through all of the different categories at the bottom. Now, we also had people coming from UParty and saying, great, it's finally there, but how can I use it for something more? I want to use some of this information. There's a great graphic in there. I want to use it as part of a presentation I'm giving at a conference next week. Matthew, can you send me? the graphic and I would go into our file database and quickly send the graphic over. Of course the request came many many times so I quickly found that actually we need to put them in a more central place uh, so that people can begin to get at them. It's not just graphics, We're, I mean we have also presentations embedded into many of the articles, not all of them and uh, it will be a lot more come the end of the year and we have seen from John's statistics that actually they're not getting that much traction. They're not being downloaded that much. You get a couple of them that are, a couple of them that aren't. And we've always had on our page this discover, adapt, share. We want people to come into the toolbox, learn something themselves, but then take it away and use it under their Creative Commons license and share it with other people. So we've had groups, we've had, I mean, I've had young guys that are coming to me from CML saying, I want to use some of this content in a training session I'm delivering as part of a conference. Where do I find content? And I would send him over to four, five, six, seven, twenty different articles in which to find all the different content. Now that worked because, as Julia mentioned, I seem to be able to keep track of where all the content is but I don't expect anyone else visiting the site to actually be able to do that because luckily for you, you've not had to read all of this content yet. So what we then started thinking, the seed was born there, how do we go about putting all of the information into one, perhaps many different places? And this is where this idea of the mini course starter kit evolved. We have had the requests from a lot of people, even today, you want to use smaller parts of the toolbox, you want to have access to a course. Um, we get a lot of people who want to run, not a full 18 month course, but a subsection that specifically addresses their need, whether that's for a community advisory board, similar to what Julio has alluded to him being involved in earlier, whether that's people who want to learn about something as part of a conference, as a tutorial, there's lots of different reasons why you'd want to deliver or take part in training on a specific area. So I'm not sure if how many of you are familiar with this graphic that was created by Jan and Bettina and Susanna and Mary uh, last year. I know it's, I, as far as I'm aware, it's still unpublished, but I know it's been floating around a lot within the community through conferences and we've got our own UParty version of it here. And what they did was they started to identify where along the medicines development process patient involvement was happening and what type of roles people were taking on. They'd already gone as far as to say what type of expertise was required. So this then got combined with our seed of an idea and thought, okay, people need to be trained more specifically into these roles what background do they need to provide this specific role? And that's where we started thinking about, uh, well, great, I saw that Nicola, thanks, apparently EMA also shares this graphic as well. It's well done Jan and the, the rest of them. Um, so we got together a small group of people um, from the different stakeholders and we met up 
for a day and a half. Uh, Julia was there as well. And we had an intense meeting where we defined what type of qualities and what background knowledge we think someone should have to be able to um, do such a role. We go about designing a training. What should they know? And when we had this brainstorm list about what we were going to offer, um, we then sought about finding it. And we thought if we base it all on the Aparti toolbox, that's already in seven different languages. It means that it can already be used in lots of different languages. Everything's released under the Creative Commons license. And for those of you that don't know quite what the Creative li Commons license means, I'm going to go into it a little bit later in this presentation. And the idea is that these, tool these starter kits should be able to support you to prepare a course. It's not going to be an out-of-the-box solution, but it's meant to be a starting point to create further information. So we also took the syllabus from our expert training course and all of the articles that we had, and we did this mapping process, a rather complicated mapping process, as I'll show you in a couple of slides on. And we started to pull together all of the content from the toolbox, and only the toolbox, because the idea is this is an exercise that anyone should be able to do whilst accessing the uparty.eu. So there's always an article that you can read. Sometimes there's presentation slide. We've also discovered ourselves how lacking some of the articles were in having supplementary material in the form of a presentation slide that makes it very easy to re reuse. Now, the way that we've gone about the Uparty toolbox anyway, as many of you know, is we've not focused on specific disease areas. We've not spoke, focused on specific countries. We've always stayed at a very European level. And that's useful in some situations, but we also recognize that you would also want to adapt it with examples coming from your own area, your own country. And so we pulled together what's the bare minimum. We reviewed that, and then we're about to share it. So we've developed nine starter kits. When I say developed, we're actually developing. As of yesterday, setting research priorities is online. I've not yet linked it to any of the menus. So if you find it, very good job to you, um, because I've kept it fairly well hidden, just so I can launch it as part of this presentation. What we're actually going to do is we're going to end up having a easy access page so you can get into any one of these areas. What you might remember is, actually all of these nine areas have come off of that diagram of places where patients are involved in medicines R&D. So we've identified some very different roles. You'll see a number of them are within the clinical area, but they're not all there. And we started working out also what was common between all of them. For example, you probably do need to have a general awareness of how medicines are developed from A to Z for any of these roles so you also understand the implications, where it's going next. So then we looked at the starter kits. They're going to contain PowerPoint slide decks, and they are heavy. I mean, they are sometimes seven slides long, but they're also sometimes 20, 30 slides long, um, usually around the 20 mark. The idea is that you don't just use them out of the box. You say, we're going to do a two-hour training session, and we need to cover five different areas. That means we only need maybe six, seven slides out of each of the out, out of each of them, and then combining it with examples or exercises from our own area. And maybe as these develop and as people use them, we'll also hear about exercises and examples that have been used that we might be able to share further with other people. So every single one of them does require a trainer to pick it up to make it their own. It's the base material, though. It contains all of those diagrams that you see floating around the website. It will contain, very shortly, a bunch of quizzes that you can use. It will contain the fact sheets where they're available as handouts that you can use. And some of you may have noticed that since about late August, we've been having a weekly growing number of case studies under our patients' involvement case reports. In the, tool, in, in the toolbox, which are one-page infographics, almost, of an example of patient involvement, but what happened, what went well, what didn't, what lessons could be learned from the area. And all of these can be pushed together to form a training. There's a lot in that toolbox, though. So this is a little um, view into 
the crazy mind that we had together of us six people and how we started mapping everything. Um, but it's great to have the perspective and very important to have the perspective always coming from the different stakeholders because when we train people, we're also try making sure that you can understand every side of the coin because it's not just about training the individual, they're going to have to find a way to communicate, to talk with someone on the other side of the table as well. So it's important to understand where they're coming from. Just because we focused on nine areas for our starter kits, that doesn't mean we're not covering medicines development as a whole. We recognize that there are core things that have to be in every single training. And so we've developed a two-phase starter kit. So that's to say there is compulsory core material in there. There's also optional material. And all of this content touches all of those different categories from basics of medicines development through to types of medicine, non-clinical, clinical development. It's all in there in one degree or another. We've provided a small trainer's manual to help you familiarize yourself with what our thought was behind the starter kits, a little bit of advice on how to use them, almost some tips and tricks from us in how we would go about training with it. It's not saying you have to do it that way, but sometimes it's useful. It'd give a different perspective and a different way of using it. And we've also provided some guidance on how to go about getting further content. Of course, we've developed these nine, and I know there's a strong desire that we actually develop a few more uh, in next year and in years going forward, but there's no reason why other people can't develop their own. And we had this question come up earlier that I answered today about if you can create your own content. And I think maybe the question was going more in the direction of the Upati expert training course. But in this area, if you were to develop a mini course, you could share it with us and we'd happily host it. I mean, effectively, we're creating an index page that links to all of the relevant articles and all of the relevant PowerPoints to allow other people to our training. So we make sure that we try and touch on each of these individual areas that we have examples, that we have quizzes, that we have presentations, that we have the images. You might have noticed some of our your party content also contains videos, so where they're available, we're embedding them in as examples that you can run. Um, we have actually make all of our videos available for download through our Vimeo site, uh, which you can get to by clicking on the link in Vimeo, uh, on, on the embedded video, and within the starter kits, I've actually been providing a direct link to the Vimeo site where you can go about downloading the video so that you can also use it offline as part of training. So from, I mean, yesterday, this page is actually available, the mini course starter kit on setting research priorities. Uh, it's there, it's available. Probably the only way to get to it at the moment is through Google until I get enough time to build an index page. Um, and that'll also be when we actually bring the other eight online. And we have a central part of the website that you can visit uh, from the front page where you'll be able to choose which starter kit you want to get into. And there will always be the same layout, there'll be information for the manual for trainers, there'll be the core reading. So you can see here, we've actually said you need to know all of the making a medicine step one through ten. Uh, there are actually other presentations there, there's not just those. Uh, these are the articles to read as background material, which may be useful to give to training course participants, but also useful for the trainer to refresh their own knowledge uh, on the area and maybe find some examples uh, that they hadn't thought of before. The presentations are all provided in a PowerPoint format, so they're completely reusable. Um, they contain all of the images that are found on the website. So that's a useful way if you want to get at the images is to actually just go and download the PowerPoint and you'll get any image that's found within that article. We've not yet added all of the presentations back into their original articles. We will. Um, it's coming. Give me hopefully until mid-November to get that done. Uh, I've unfortunately got only so many minutes in the day. And we've also got quizzes coming. So it was one of the requests we've had from a couple of people who went to go and look, and also people who've been through the Upati expert course because they remember as part of most of the lessons there, we had little knowledge check quizzes with two or three questions that allowed you to 
think about what you just learned and, and take a quick test. And we're going to provide those for each presentation. And the idea there is that you will then be able to use them either to run a quiz on paper, quiz electronically, but you can also develop it into discussion points or little breakout groups within a training environment. So that's a very brief introduction into what we envisage for the starter kit. It was based off of what we would find useful as trainers ourselves. So it does come out of our own personal view. But we also wanted to give an idea of what we were doing with it and share that back to the Uparty community. Because if we're taking the time to do it for ourselves, we might as well also share it and make sure everyone else has it. And hopefully going forward, we'll see a lot more little training sessions being run on the Uparty material. And this is the way you can do it. I mean, everything that we release is under this copyright of Creative Commons licensing. Uh, it basically means there's a free copyright on it. You don't have to pay us for the content. You cannot use it commercially. So we've actually got a page dedicated to this on the website that I strongly encourage you to read. The link is provided in all of the starter kits. But as long as you give your party credit, and you, you're welcome to change it as well, as long as you give your party credit and uh, use it non-commercially, it's yours to do what you want with. Um, we've got a nice page explaining all of that. In different situations, we also include examples of how you would credit your party or any other Creative Commons work you might use in your work. So I'm going to wrap up about that. And you're welcome to ask me questions about the starter kit. Um, if and when you run out of questions on the starter kit, I'm also happy to try and answer any other questions that you might have about the toolbox as it currently stands and anything else that might be coming into it before the end of the project at the end of January. Thank you, Mark. You. Thank you very much. I think it was. I, I, I want to ask you immediately a very technical and stupid question. Where on the website, on the upati.eu website, will the starter kits be available? Exactly. So the, we can go and find them very easy. So I was discussing this with John uh, just this week, and I think I've managed to negotiate really hard with him to get a nice spot right in the middle of the page underneath the current categories that are there to search, search the toolbox and we'll probably be putting a link to it also in the how to adapt so there was the adapt button that's in the middle of the page at the moment we'll also be having a link there but there will be a clear image signposting it straight off the front page that you can click on okay but uh, I, I guess that it, it will also be available in the Uparty resources sub menu Yes, that is correct. We'll also create a page there, and they'll all go into a index page that will then allow you to choose your starter kit that you want to use. Great. Thank you very much. Um, do you have any plan about how, when all the starter kits will be ready? Uh, I don't think they are going to be published all together at the same time, but just you, you will upload them once they're ready, am I right? That's right. Once I have the first two or three uploaded and in their ready form, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll create that link off the front page. Uh, at the moment, uh, the way it's looking, I'm going to say it's going to be mid-November. So probably about the 17th, 18th of November, that type of time frame. And the first three will be online then. All of them will be online before the Uparty conference that happens mid-December, uh, so they'll all be ready by then. That will be only in English for now. I mean, as soon as I upload them, I send them off for translation, but those of you who've been monitoring how we update content on the toolbox will probably have noticed there's between a three and six or seven week delay um, with the other languages. They come on a rolling basis. They don't all come at once, but they will be there very soon. Uh, um, I have a question from Ulrich uh, here. Um, will all kits be available uh, in all languages at the same time? I mean, once you upload a, a, a starter kit, it will be available already for the whole languages, or just in English and then other languages? 
so when I upload it, it is uploaded in English and then it goes through our translation process. And as I alluded to earlier when I answered a question, when we send something off for translation, uh, it goes off to different translators uh, for the different six translations that we do under the official new party. Uh, we also have the obviously the other two uh, languages that John's alluded to coming as well that we look at pushing them to. We've not pushed them that content yet. And we then have to wait for the translation process to happen. A translation review is part of that process and only then do they get pushed up. So it's typically, I'd say, a month after the publishing in English that is available in the other languages. Unfortunately, there's no real way to stop that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a, a technical flaw, shall we say, in the system that we can only push it into English first. No, no, that's clear. Thank you, Matthew. I see that some participants are raising their hands on the on the system. I would encourage them and everybody, if you have questions, please type your questions in the question box so that we can read it and, and, and answer it. <clears throat> there is a, a, another question. I will read the question, then I have some comments to, to make here. I think that there is no content on vaccines as it as it is mainly about medicines. If you want to create some content on vaccines development, etc., could it be also uploaded on the website? I think the, the, this, Matthew, I don't know whether you agree, has to do also with the possibility from users to create new presentation using maybe also different starter kits and just collecting all the, the slides or the the parts that they think they're interested in and trying to set up their own um, presentation for, for their needs. Yeah, I, th I think at the moment, if I remember correctly, there's only a very brief half-page description on what vaccines are that's found under our types of medicine category. If uh, Isabel wants to go ahead and create content on in more detail on vaccine development, I mean, it's correctly identified, we focused on medicines development or should we say traditional medicines development all throughout your party. Um, we've barely, if at all, touched on medical devices. We did not touch on vaccines any more than saying, here's a very brief explanation of what they are. Um, I personally would their content to be created. Uh, if it is created by the community, you need to, I mean, the best thing first is to get in touch with us by email so that we know it's going to happen. We have some guidelines that we can provide. And it will then go through the same review process that all content goes through before it goes onto the party website. Uh, it goes through a language check to try and align the language. Um, we don't want in, our, in any of our content, anything to be too scientific and in, inaccessible uh, to the majority of the us users. So we, we try to aim for an accessible level of language. Um, we'll, it will also go through a check by all of the different stakeholders. We check for neutrality, we check for transparency. Um, all of these different things are checked by the editorial group. And the editorial group going forward in the project is going to again have regular meetings. So when such content would be ready, we would simply slot it into the editorial review program and we can see about pushing it into the UParty toolbox, um, into the core and hosting it there. So can we say that the, the list of topics for the starter kits that you showed uh, some minutes is not fixed in stone? I mean, it can be we can work on, on that list, we can maybe integrate some other topics. Correct. I mean, it's not just even for the starter kits. So any any content that in the toolbox, I mean, if people know of things that need to be updated, they're also welcome to get in touch with us. They're welcome to propose updates. Um, that is all possible. Uh, it is very much um, becoming and will become even more so uh, from the, the time that we finish as the UParty project under IMI and become the UParty program going forward, um, a community-driven effort. So we will gladly accept people proposing new content. We'll, I mean, we would like you to write it um, and, and we'll help in the review process. And that goes for articles, 
it also goes for starter kits. If you find a way that you're using the content, um, we are interested to know about it. And it's also an opportunity now that we have the blog running more actively for if you're interested to talk about how you're using the Uparty toolbox with others, that you also explain how that's working uh, via our blog, for example. But get in touch with us through the uh, contact link. There's an email on uh, the Uparty website or through social media. We can make sure it goes through the right channels so that we can kickstart those things happening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, I have another question, maybe for John, because it is more related to the technical uh, issues of, of, of the website also. Um, we know that the, 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 the IT working group has to focus also on accessibility issues for the website so that it can be used by uh, any kind of, of, of user, also maybe someone with kind of not, um, uh, sight impairment or stuff like that. Do you know, John, uh, can you tell us w which are the features of the website in this sense? So how, how accessible it is for any kind of user and how uh, these features are used? Certainly, yeah. I mean, we have some basic levels um, that can be used with terms of accessibility. Um, it is possible on the interface of the screen to enlarge the text to make it big on every page. Um, that's some help. You can also, uh, there's a contrast but button on the top that will induce a very high contrast on the page uh, that may suit certain people. Um, the website is built to be responsive, so if you're not looking at it, if you're looking at it on a tablet or a phone, um, that can be enlarged uh, by pinch and touch um, to get as big as possible. Um, and by and large, the code where possible has been built to uh, reflect accessibility standards. But as always with these websites, they could be better. And at the initial website, uh, we did engage an advocacy group in Ireland uh, fighting blindness to review the site for us. Um, and we we got to a certain level with that. I mean, the way the website's built using open source software, um, it's it's really disappointing in that a lot of these free software, you know, accessibility is not high on the agenda list. And but um, we are looking at building a new, uh, possibly improving the design of the website before January, in which now that a lot of the content has settled into place. Um, it would certainly be a goal to try and improve that accessibility um, a little bit more. And there's actually some software we could get in um, that could make the screen reading a little bit easier. So we have built tools in for enlarging text and for improving content or improving contrast. Um, but I would really need to sit down again with the screen reader and see how much fun it is to use because <laughs> Like most websites using a screen reader, it's not much fun. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Getting back to to no, but, uh, yes, to Matthew, but probably also both of you. Um, Matthew, you were presenting about how to use the starter kits in, in particular. But um, can we use any material we can find on, in the UPATI platform to create our own presentations for our needs as patients organization? I'm talking. I mean, if I want to, uh, we had had the example of vaccines uh, earlier, but also if uh, if I want to 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 use any any kind of, of article or information I can find or infographic I can find on the on the UPATI. In general, can I use it to, for my presentation? Or always on the on the Creative um, uh, Commons li license? Yeah, if you can find it, you can use it. Um, not to say that it's hard to find things on the Uparty website, uh, but if it's there in the educational, I mean, every everything it's there. Even the webinars are released. Um, we have everything clearly labeled with this copyright notice that I think I'm showing on the page now at the bottom um, to clearly denote everything that is 
licensed under Creative Commons and you're welcome to reuse it. And every single article, every single image uh, that we've created with the, with the party logo on it, you're welcome to reuse those. Um, every presentation, every fact sheet, please go ahead, please reuse it, but please also make changes. You know, update it to your own countries, include the, I mean, we've, we've had to ensure that we always use the sort of the lowest common denominator, which is, of course, the EU or the European legislation. And in many countries, there is more specific information given in national law, national rules, national best practices, and put those in when you reuse it. Um, it makes it very valuable and much more tangible uh, for other people seeing it. Thank you very much. And another question from me, if other uh, participants want to ask questions, again, please type uh, them on, in the question box. Uh, we've seen that there are so many visitors from Italy, I'm Italian, so <laughs> I'm kind of proud of, uh, of it. But can we uh, elaborate a bit about why this is happening and how, how also other communities can maybe do something to, uh, to yeah, to increase the, the accesses from, from their own countries. Um, I can't specifically tell you why more people from Italy are accessing the website. I can tell you that it is delivered equally across all of Europe <laughs> um, in terms of speed and what people see. Um, the Italians are clearly more active. Um, and certainly the second part of your question about how people can become more involved, you know, I guess reach out to your national platforms um, in each country. These are the conduit um, from grassroots level to the UPATI teams that run the project. Um, and if you look on the website, you know, on the top link there it says UPATI in your country. It lists all of the countries um, where UPATI is established. And actually, if you go to the English version of the website, um, you'll probably see some more countries because there will be countries there that are not in the specific um, original project that we've only provided in English. But if you want to get more involved, that is a good place to start. Um, but of course, um, Matthew and myself, you know, we are available directly with any questions and the contact form on the website um, is a place to leave some information but certainly do it to do it from a local perspective you know contact your local um, uh, UPATI national team and you know see how you can get involved that way or how you can contribute thank you John I think that Matthew is showing us on the on, on his screen also, um, one of the reasons why there are so many accesses from Italy, uh, there, there was this initiative organized in Italy, which was very successful, and, and maybe this helped in promoting the UPATI platform in general. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, there, there's another question from Marcel, reusing and adapting content. Don't you want to use these efforts to update and improve the central content? I'm not sure I can get the point of Marcel's questions, but I trust that Matthew, who can understand everything, maybe <laughs> can answer even the, these questions, which I cannot understand very well. Maybe it's a way to get a feedback from the presentation that people are creating using the UPATI material and then using them back to improve the, the repository. Yeah, and I mean, Marcel has gone and alluded to um, the idea of a wiki. I mean, we debated about the idea of a wiki in the early phases of the uh, UPARTY project. And the, I mean, Wikipedia is the, is the biggest wiki that uh, everyone knows. And as you may or may not know, when you sign up to Wikipedia, you begin editing content, you can very quickly get in and edit your first article and update it. Um, but you can also write whatever you want. And it then takes 
couple of days or a couple of hours for a volunteer moderator to come and change it or accept what you've done uh, or kick you off the system if you're maliciously changing articles. Um, and so one of the things that we promoted so strongly within your party is that your party remains this neutral, transparent, reliable and authoritative source of information on medicines development, which is why we've gone through all of the different review cycles. And I'll just bring up um, the information I have on the website. I think it's under reliable information. We have this huge process that I'm showing here um, that we've done over a four-year process of all of these different reviews of our contents gone through, uh, external, internal, etc. So we don't open up the Uparty website in the same manner as a wiki so that there is instant change by people. We've had a couple of people approach us over the course of the toolbox being live of can I update or can I provide more information on this topic you've written an article for and we've always said yes you know please go ahead but we will feed it into our extensive process so at the top here of the green and it'll go through all of these different tests and all of this different sign off before it is published so yes we would love you to use um, I don't remember how you said how much time it would take to go through a review process so to give you an idea um, I think the question just came from Isabel, how much time does it take to go through the review process? We have just approved, and or sh or sh I should say, I have just uploaded last week content that was written in April. So that content that was written in April and updated in April has only just gone online. So it typically does take us about four months to get it online, and that's in English. Then there's the additional four weeks of translation and translation review. So it is a considerable length of time. It does mean that we are completely sure that our content is factually correct, is neutral. And we have done everything in our power to make sure it stays that way. With the reusing and the adapting of content, we lose control a little bit. I'm not saying you should take the content and do whatever you want with it maliciously. Um, but the point is once it's out there, you know, you download it, you can reuse it how you want. Um, when it is something that's valuable to the whole community, we would love you to share it back with us so that we can again share it with everyone else. But we will push it through that same very rigorous review process. Um, so if you want to get involved in updating content, Marcel, I would be more than happy to have you come and update content with me, um, but also recognize that it, it will take time to get it out there for the community. And maybe almost now where we're at a point in the project where the content is still very up to date, um, that we begin using our efforts over the next six months to actually distribute it further to more and more communities within uh, all of the U Party stakeholders so that everyone can benefit from all of the work that's gone through over hundreds or thousands of person hours in this project to deliver this educational material to everyone. Um, so I wouldn't say that there is a pro or con to either, um, to, to either updating or to reusing and adapting. Both should happen, both need to be done. Thank you, Matthew, with this very thorough explanation. I, I think we can close our webinar now if we, there is no uh, other question from the participants. I want to thank you, John, you, Matthew, and all the participants for taking part to the, to the webinar. There will be also another webinar in the upcoming weeks or months uh, for EU party. You will be informed about that about the, from the usual um, um, mailing lists and websites and all the, the tools we have to keep our, our people informed about the, all, all the initiatives. I want also to remind everybody that this webinar will be, has been recorded and will be uploaded very soon on the UParty website, so you can um, find it on the, on the website and share it with your colleagues if you, if you want to do so. 
Uh, I w again, thank you everybody. Have a good evening and I hope to meet you soon. Bye-bye.